Hello, everyone. I'm author Shalina Michelle Tate, and this is week one officially of my, I guess you could go ahead and call it an ebook um, of Foster. I will be doing a uh, two chapter reading every Saturday in the month of January. And so, why are we here? Well, once again, my name is author Shalina Michelle Tate, and I'm wanting to basically um, share. Uh, like an audio book form of Foster in preparation of new material I will be doing um, coming up. Super excited about that. And I would love for any of you to uh, participate in the reading. You can leave a comment. You can visit the publisher um, and get more information. This book, Foster, uh, was published by Teresa Wright of Write Stuff Publications. I could leave her information in the link below. And so I'm super excited because um, I'm wanting to kind of do an introduction to who I am and what's all going on before I get into the reading um, that I have scheduled. So uh, for this reading, I'm going to do two chapters of the book Foster, which you see there in the picture right there. Um, and basically Foster is my first installment of it's supposed to be a, a three-part memoir of my personal experience growing up in the South Carolina foster care system um, and basically taking you on a journey of what that was like and the lessons that I learned along the way. I know foster adoption orphan and underserved communities always kind of get the negative stereotypes of what happens to people who go through those um, circumstances and situations. And so, of course, my journey has been growing to kind of show the achievement side and the achievement focus of um, those communities. Um, anyone who's listening may also know I have a podcast called Fostered My Stories, which is achievement focused for those communities as well. Also, am working on um, other number of other um, endeavors to just bring it all together. I have three brands that's in development. That's the Fostered My Stories brand, where I'm going to be helping people tell their stories, achievement focused stories from those communities. Then I have the Gracefully Chosen brand, which houses the um, Foster My Stories podcast, and then uh, stronger efforts towards those communities. And then um, TFOM, which is my um, 501c3, is uh, going to provide really establishments and services um, locally and hopefully in other states. Um, achievement centers and just the other efforts with other professionals that I'm linked to. But once again, my name is author Shirley Michelle Tate, and I am doing, this is the week one of <laughs> the, um, go ahead and call it the audiobook reading of Foster. And really, this book is to encourage anybody who's going through those circumstances and situations, fostered, adoption, orphan, underserved, you know, I know we always get negative press and negative, you know, outlooks or stereotypes or, you know, news and media. Um, but I want to encourage, you know, people from those fellow communities that you can write your story and you can find the growth and development and the lessons from life and not let it hold you there in your past. And this reading is also to inspire those who have never been through those communities. So um, you don't have to have gone through the foster adoption orphan or underserved community to know that you have purpose and value. You have purpose and value, you know, right where you are. And a lot of times, and I say this often on the podcast, a lot of times um, our past is, you know, part of our purpose for a greater future. Um, it doesn't always seem that way when we're going through circumstances and situations that we can't control or have no answers to or want to change. Um, even the most devastating circumstances can bring uh, healing when we get there and meaning and purpose and not just for ourselves, but for the people we're connected to, the communities we're connected to, and the lives we want to you know, eventually change. But once again, that's a day-by-day -day process, one step at a time, as I like to say. And so welcome to week one of the reading. Once again, this is author Shalene Michelle Tate, and you are on my week one audiobook premiere of Foster, which once again is the first of a three-part memoir journey that takes you from uh, the foster care system 
after, which is emancipation, going into adulthood, and then their spiritual journey as well. Um, but aside from that, other projects I'm working, other projects I'm working on include um, preparation for short films. So I'm super excited about that. I could go into more details. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. This uh, audio chapter one and two is coming to you live here. Um, super excited. Uh, so let's dive right in. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them um, for me and I will get to them after the reading of chapters one and two. Any participation is welcome. Any questions you may have are welcomed as well. If you have questions about foster care, um, something I've read, uh, something that you're wanting to know more about, feel free to leave them in the comments and I will get to them after the reading. All right, so without further ado, this is uh, Fostered. I'm reading chapters one and two. And feel free, uh, I put this in the post, but if you want to follow along, I have an ebook copy of Fostered, which you can get there on Amazon. And it's right there also in the description of the post on the page that you're looking at right now. It says, I want to read along, grab your, your Kindle. And so that link right there, you can type that link in and grab your copy um, via that link. But you could also listen in right now. Um, on what I'm about to read and stay connected. I'm hoping by the end of this reading, the full book, I'll have some more updates and surprises for you. So yeah, let's get into it. Foster is by myself, um, Shoni Michelle Tate, published by Write Stuff Publications. Um, Teresa Wright was the publisher um, and I am wanting to give her credit as well. Um, I know my name is on it, but she helped me get it all um, organized and put together. So, all right, so let's dive in. So this book, Dedication, God Must Get All the Glory for Bringing Me This Far. It's his love, grace, and mercy, and truth that has carried me. It also, through him, I've discovered my purpose and continue to grow in his gifting. I acknowledge that I need him in every part of my life, I also dedicate this book to all current and past foster children and non-foster children. I have touched on many of your feelings of discouragement, rejection, or abuse. God preordained my parents and the people that have been involved in my life. I'm honored with them to share this journey with my potential readers. Mother, as I call her, you have been ordained to nurture me as your child. I'm grateful to be a part of the chapter of your life, in your life. Although I wasn't yours by birth, I know God, through your kindness, was part of my healing. I'm honored to acknowledge that you've encouraged much of my development without your patience and peacefulness. I wouldn't be introduced to the love of God. You are a dynamic mother. I hope to give back the love you have given me. To my mentors, God know or knows uh, what I needed through each of you. I'm humbled that your mentorship was furthered or has furthered the purpose God has placed over my life. I'm grateful for the life lessons and tough love you've instilled in me. I'm further grateful for all of life's, life's lessons and my developing ministry and both. All right, so that was the dedication um, of the book, and let's dive into it. So I'm going to share my screen real quick before I get right into uh, the reading. I want you to see what's coming up. And once again, every Saturday in the month of January, I will be reading two chapters of Foster. So by the time we get to the end, um, we have we will have completed four weeks, right? Four weeks in the month of January. So uh, I want you to see what's coming up. Let's see. All right. So as you see coming up um, for today, I will be reading Daddy's Little Girl, Chapter One, and then Introduction to Foster Care. Week two will introduce you to uh, I Could Have Died in meeting number one chapter. Um, and then week three, uh, 
will introduce you to a hands-on kind of person and then standing alone and then wrapping everything up with this uh, week four will introduce you to what was I thinking in the unexpected milestone and once again um, this book is really a dedication to just encourage those who are going through anything and you may not have particularly going through foster care but whatever you're going through in your life is really to encourage you that no matter the, the circumstances or the outlook you know greatness can happen where it seems like there's no hope and of course that comes in with sometimes the writing. For me, writing was part of my healing. Sometimes singing or dancing or music, whatever your um, positive go-to, uh, find that and that helps bring healing and then that also in turn help bring and process his stories, right? So let's get into it. Right now on page, if you're following along, I'm, I'm reading the introduction, all right? Where do I begin? So much has changed since I initially wanted to get this memoir published. When I first decided to write, I was unhealthy mentally, physically, and emotionally. I could only see what was before me and the multiple issues I have faced. My name is Shalina Michelle Tate, a former foster child with three testimonies I've been waiting to birth. At age 27 in prior attempts, and this book is basically a couple years old, but that's okay. I thought I could only share my foster care experience verbally. Even during those times, I have people express, well, why haven't you written yours? And so-and-so has. I mean, I wasn't mature or strong enough to know yet that everything has timing and could only, could be used for greater, his greater purpose. During those attempts, I imagine all I had to talk about was just being in the foster care system. Now, well past my 30s, <laughs> early 30s, and with growth, I realized I can share much more. In this part of the series, I like to share my foster care journey, life after leaving foster care, and how my spiritual walk has molded me into who I am in Christ. I mean, you could ask, and many have, well, what, what took so long? Well, God's timing is perfection. Um, I'm also now realizing this and how my spiritual journey shaped my writings. With this new understanding, I'm finally at a place to share my testimony, and it has revealed that I could help others being asked to speak about my potential memoir at a Black Expo was a revelation. A close friend and I had met Mr. Charles Flantor at, at the 2012 Black Expo. Mr. Flantor was a medium built brown skinned man with a smile for days. <laughs> My friend had led me to sit in on one of his conferences. Inside we learned he was a Christian self-publisher who testified how God took him everywhere. He testified about his past and how God used him to get the glory. This also brought favor everywhere he went. Meeting with him afterward, we were questioned why we were procrastinating on writing our books. My friend and I were full of excuses only to realize Mr. Flanter might be right. Right, not because so-and-so had, but because we needed to take a leap of faith. Despite that leap, everything still had timing and commitment. In the years that followed, it, it's been confirmed continuously by my speaking, writing, and the encouragement it would bring. Today, I'm still in contact with Mr. Flantor and that friend whose books I can't wait to see published. I'll continue talking about this meeting with them in part two and of this memoir series. So, Foster and I'm kind of going through now, fostered um, part one of this memoir will take readers through my personal 17 year journey in the foster care system. I've seen many youth and children today face similar struggles and setbacks. And I liked this testimony to reach any reader who has ever felt invisible, neglected, abused, or misunderstood. I'd like readers to focus on the achievements despite the given circumstances. 
in part two entitled Entangled addresses my personal battles to adjust to life after leaving the foster care system. Today, many emancipated and those who left the system foster care um, foster you face many obstacles with their similar um, ordeals without the right mentors or advocates. Many are caught up in the streets, homeless or defeated. I would like to take readers through the struggles I face entering adulthood. And once again, I like the focus to be on victories and the learning experiences that shaped me into adulthood. Finally, part three developed addresses the path to my current spiritual journey. This section exposes spiritual battles and triumphs as I continue growing in my walk. My growth in Christ has helped me re really research what is God's purpose and how that testimony can give him all the glory. Yes, I could have done with a book, but breaking it up ties my journey into needed categories. I'm just humbled to have the confirmation to write after years of procrastination and the uncertainty, if I even could. Uh, to readers, I'll give a fair heads up on anything graphic accounts and a to basically aid in specific ordeals. So thank you for sharing this journey with me. And although it's taken years <laughs> to complete, um, I'm on a, a great road of recovery. So once again, that's just the introduction. And I, I may be paraphrasing some things um, as well as we go through. But once again, if you're following along with me, feel free to read through as I dive right in. And I will take a Mind a little breaks because you know, as you talk and read and do anything, you need some water, right? All right, let's get into it. Chapter one Daddy's Little Girl. Well, before I could understand anything about my life as a foster child, I fleetingly remember a few earlier childhood memories. These accounts include spending time with my father, staying with Miss Holston, and attending a local daycare. I was an 80s baby, born January 12, 1984. I feel that time was a lot more carefree then. Although I was quite young, I definitely remember these points when writing. It's funny how many may assume a child is too young to understand anything. The truth is, it depends on the joy or pain those particular moments brought. Accounts of being daddy's little girl takes me <laughs> to snippets of interesting endeavors. Memories include eating pancakes at McBurger, walking across a bridge, daddy's beer, and eating lemon cookies. At the time, I didn't know the McBurger meal was a visitation, and we were homeless crossing over the highway bridge at night. While crossing the bridge, I listened to Daddy's songs on the then popular cassette tape, Stevie Wonder's Part-Time Lover and Atlantic Stars Always were the songs I never forget. My dad is a medium-built brown-skinned man with sparkling brown eyes and a short black beard. I don't think I've ever seen my dad without a beard. Past pictures show I have his eyes and smile. While visiting a greenhouse, my dad and a group of his friends were sitting around drinking beer. Not knowing better, I asked for a sip, which my dad let me have. I didn't ask again as my dad and his friends started laughing at the look of disgust on my face. <laughs> um, on a visit to the lady with the lemon cookies, I accidentally stepped in a ant pile and as you can imagine, I was stomping around in agony, crying while my dad knocked them off me. I also didn't know that the visit to the cookie lady was my dad's attempt to find a babysitter. Now, before you ask, no, I don't recall spending any time with my mother. I believe it's because I was still a young baby when I was with her. My meeting with Miss Holston eventually became familiar However, before I introduce Ms. Holston first, I'll share how I lived with my father. Yes, I said earlier we were homeless. I found that out later in life and believed the bridge was his scouting efforts. 
I also don't remember sleeping in cardboard boxes because I was probably asleep once we crossed the end of that bridge. My dad didn't tell me about the cardboard boxes despite this. And before, Miss Halston, I only know of the apartment I live in. I believe my dad got an apartment with a woman who wasn't my mom. And I'm saying this because of the different woman I saw. I saw my dad kiss a woman in that apartment. The lady was slender and brown skinned with a pushback bun and tight, short black dress. The pictures I've seen of my mom looks nothing like her. I'd been told I look like my mother. Well, that's very true. If you've seen me, you'd seen her. And <laughs> later in life, people assumed I was her. Within every picture, my mom's hair and clothes always seem messy to look at. The only picture I've seen of her looking neat was one where she was dressed alike, where well, we were dressed alike. In the photo, my mom and I wore matching red and white outfits. I had on a red dress with white ruffles and my hair was pushed up in a bun. I looked directly ahead as my mother pointed in the photo. My mother was in the middle of telling me to look at the camera. So my mom wore her hair in short curls and had a white jacket, skirt, and red blouse. I noticed she wore silver caps also. Later in life, I also faced many of the dental and medical issues she had faced or passed on to my siblings and me. I'll share these issues later at our reunions. Back in the apartment with my dad, I had um, my own attic room. It seemed as if it was made especially for me. The bed I laid on was up against the right side of the wall, while a white framed square window was on the wall directly in front of me. In the mornings, dad popped his head up in to retrieve me. The opening in the floor was where he climbed up the stairs to get me. Each morning, I wake up to the sun shining through the window and me holding a big stuffed banana in my arms. When dad came in, he picked me up and carried me downstairs to get ready for the day. When it was time to eat, I sat at a table set inside a closet with a pool string light. I remember always eating SpaghettiOs. In the mornings, I attended a local daycare. This child care center was within walking distance from the apartment complex where we lived. I walked with a group of students and parents who came around to each apartment. The adults knocked on the door in certain apartments asking if certain children were attending the center that day. Things sure have changed. You can't do that now. I believe attending the daycare was also the end of me living with Miss Holston. Miss Belinda Holston's home brings back a few weird memories. Michael Jackson was always on television. We ate the same thing every day, and I slept in the same room with five other kids at night. Michael Jackson's another part of me seemed to be the only thing I saw on TV. I believe this contributed a lot to how I used to be a huge fan. Yes, I said used to be. I'll share more on that later. I know we ate the same thing every day because I'll never forget the taste. Now, I don't know if it was because of the number of kids in the home or Miss Holston didn't know what else to fix. Pork and beans with grits. I remember it was too hot. Not with heat, but with pepper. And she was heavy handed with the pepper. I'm surprised I still eat pork and beans. I just don't add any pepper. <laughs> Miss Holston was a heavyset, light skinned woman who looked to be in her late 40s to early 50s. It seems she wore rollers in her hair and a pink robe always. I never seen her in real clothes. Despite this, she had a huge collection of perfumes and powder. I, mean, I know because I, she caught me playing with them. I remember her telling me to get out of her room. I, all, I often stare at a picture of her 
daughter that hung on the hallway wall. Candace was her name. She looked just like Miss Holston, except she was slender with long brown hair. The picture may have been a prom picture because uh, she was holding a pretty pink rose. Although the picture was taken from the waist up, Candace wore a velvet dress that showed off her bare shoulders as she smiled. At the Holston house, I attended a different daycare. Candace would uh, pick me up in the mornings and take me there. Each morning, she would spit on her thumb and wipe the saliva from around my mouth. Yeah, I know, icky. <laughs> I'm almost sure Candace had her own place because this was the only time I saw her. At the child care center, I was fascinated by the peanut butter I could pick up and eat from a large clear bucket without reprimand. I don't remember much else aside from playing with a wooden dollhouse and alphabet blocks. Back at Miss Holston's house, I didn't question who the other children living there were. They may have been Miss Holston's grandchildren. However, in the daytime, I often play with them outside. This was short-lived because one of the teenagers from the neighborhood, a skinny, dark-skinned boy who came to visit all the kids, when he came over, he always flipped up his eyelids, you know, flipping where the pink of the lids showed prominently. Ugh, he really scared me. I ran inside crying every time. I always didn't. <laughs> it also didn't help the fact that he chased me around with his eyelids in that position. Running inside the house crying, Miss Holston would tell me not to go back outside. However, that wasn't really even the scary part of staying in this house. At night, while I was in the room with the other kids, strange things went on. Now, I don't know how to explain this. Either the other kids were messing with me or it was spiritual warfare. At, and I'll go into what that means later. After a few nights in the room with the kids, I started seeing things. Now, I'm fully aware I stayed in a room with other children, but this was beyond weird. Around the same time, every night, I was wakened um, as I felt myself being poked on my body. I freaked out. home and there's a lot of background noise so I apologize for that. Um, I opened my eyes to see someone standing over me in an astronaut suit with glowing with a glowing helmet. Seeing the odd figure I tossed the covers over my head. After a few minutes Miss Holston came in the room and turned on the lights. When the lights came on of course no one was there. The other kids in the room were already fast asleep. Miss Holston told me to go in the bathroom and brush my teeth. Now, if it were one of the others, you'd think I'd hear snickering or moving around, but I never did. After about three nights of this, Miss Holston decided to move me into the living room where I slept well on the couch. I didn't have any more issues and woke, would wake up fresh with a good night's sleep to start the day. I never figured out what was really occurring. To this day, I can't really explain that either. You know, I don't know. Um, maybe it was one of the other kids and they just was able to get back down in time before anything happened. But I'm not sure. Um, have you ever had any strange experiences like that? I would love to hear about them. All right. Shortly after that strange occurrence, I started attending a new daycare and seeing less of Miss Holston, whatever the case I'll never forget the experience I had while attending this new daycare center. The moments I shared earlier living with my dad is the time I also went to the new childcare place. This place, however, doesn't leave positive memories. One little girl got spanked every day by her dad for messing in her clothes. I was sad to hear her crying in the bathroom. Also, I hear kids screaming from the back room. I didn't figure out why until the day I took up for a little girl. There was a little girl that was being fussed at by one of the teachers. I forgot why, but 
because I took up for her. I was locked in the closet in a back room. What, you ask? Yes. That's where they put all kids who quote unquote acted out. I called it the punishment closet and it was the scariest thing besides being poked in the middle of the night. Getting locked in, I of course screamed and cried and banged on the door to get out. Before the door closed, I saw a clown sitting in a chair. The more I screamed, the more it laughed and eyes flashed red. Looking back, I can imagine that clown must have been noise censored or motion censored. I personally hope that daycare got shut down or at least the staff replaced. During another day of rounds with the group, I saw people going in and out of my dad's apartment. You know, it's funny how I just knew it was his. I expressed to the adult I was walking with, hey, my dad lives there. The lady mumbled, not anymore. I didn't know what she meant by that until I went to the daycare center the very next day. I was sitting at a table playing with placement blocks. A short, dark-skinned man with a mustache, chocolate suit, and short afro came inside to talk with the staff. Eventually, he approached me at the table. The staff said it's fine to talk to him. That's the first time I met Mr. Alan Franks. I was too young to comprehend what was happening. Also, I was never taught not to talk to, to or go with strangers. Once again, this was the 80s and things were a lot more carefree. I can see how many children during this time may have gone missing. Pause right here. Thank you for your patience. Once again, feel free to leave comments in the comment section. Any questions you may have, I will get to them after the reading. Okay. Mr. Alvin didn't say much, but that my parents knew I was coming with him. He took me to McBurger and then eventually to the Department of Social Services, or as it's commonly referred to, DSS. Inside, someone took me to a waiting room with parents and other children. Eventually, Mr. Franks came in from a back office only to place me in a single wooden bench outside of in the hallway. Speaking to my dad later as an adult, I asked him what happened that day. Of course, it was the 80s, so cell phones weren't everywhere yet, but I also wonder why he didn't call from his job. My father expressed that he started getting off of work late. He also shared how Miss Holston neglected to pick me up on time. I wondered if the daycare had to call DSS because of this. Now that I think back, my dad probably struggled to pay her, whatever the case. I would never see Miss Holston again. Also, I wouldn't see my dad again until graduating from high school at the age of 18. I realized that DSS followed different guidelines back in the day. I like, I like many have felt that a person could just call DSS and children could be placed or taken away from their parents without proper investigation. A neighbor, family member, or stranger could place a call to the agency. Today, there must be enough reliable evidence in an investigation to be a case. Working briefly with an agency uh, two years ago or so, and in the book it says um, a few weeks, but the update is two years ago. This statement, um, as I, this statement, um, as I filed paperwork, I noticed how relatives reported a lot of cases. Yet, if something was not right, it was better if they reported it. However, I could discern that majority of the calls within ear distance were from individuals getting back at the accused. I won't get into the cases, but was disappointed to notice it daily. Uh, yeah, let me let me pause here. Yes, um, now I do know and I commend those who are able to report abuse and neglect, which yes, please report any cases of abuse and neglect but um, from my discernment working there briefly, um, I, I just 
discernment that it was caused that was like, I'm going to get back at you. I don't ask me why I knew that. I just did. And I will say this, um, working on some cases, I could just tell that kids were placed back with the perpetrator and it shouldn't have been. Okay, let me continue because I could go on, on about that. <laughs> but before you ask where, where my mother was or a relative to set up or basically set up, step up, let me express that I have asked that question well into adulthood. It's only now that I can honestly write about this in peace. Not only did I have to forgive them, but stop blaming myself. What I had to learn from this ordeal is your family and parents can only provide what they can give emotionally or otherwise. As a young adult, I learned both my parents had lost their parental rights due to neglect However, I now have the understanding to know that they weren't in the right frame of mind. So my mother was labeled schizophrenic um, at 16 when she gave birth to me. So schizophrenia is defined as a mental disorder characterized by abnormal social, behavioral, and failure to understand what is real. Now, this is what she was labeled as, but I will say, and I can only say from my perspective, for me, I felt she was in spiritual warfare, not so much a labeling of schizophrenia. Okay, I'll get more into that in another book, All right? Let's continue. Later, meeting my grandparents, I concluded that my mother was mostly sheltered because of her illness. Also, it didn't help that dad was nine years older. So technically, this could have been considered statutory rape, not to sound bizarre, but that age gap seemed to be the normal back then. I imagine when I was about to come, be born, my grandparents felt the need to protect mom more. I believe that's the only reason daddy's name wasn't on the birth certificate. Now, I still don't know how my mom and dad came to meet. God already knew his plan. He knew my parents were the ones who bring me forth. Let me pause right there. We can't, as individuals, plan who our parents would be. And I know a lot of us have questions of, why is this my mom? Why is this my dad? And it may be hard to imagine, but I'm going to express that God already knew. God already foreknew that your mom would be your mom and your dad would be your dad it does not matter how you got here let me express that why because your life is for a greater purpose i'll get more into that okay and that's not in the book okay <laughs> let me continue uh so he knew my parents were the ones who bring me forth this ghost is saying for you and here we go i, I basically express this i can only imagine your question about why your parents are who they are God knew beforehand they would be chosen for you. Once we come to the knowledge of Christ, then healing and deliverance for family, neglect, and abuse can begin. Like me, many people have coped with unresolved family issues. The issues from that kind of warfare can go back many generations. What I've come to learn is that you can seek help from a therapist, counselor, friend, or spouse, but it's all for nothing. Healing can only begin when you first truly forgive the people or persons that hurt you. Saying I can forgive but can't forget means you haven't truly forgiven. The cry to God is for you to forgive their misdeeds and to forgive yourself. This is a, a journey that everyone has to come to personally. It's not forced. It's not, you know, back and force you or to come to that. It's just something you, you choose to or want to come to in your own terms. And when you do, that's when the healing can begin. I'm only speaking from experience. All right, to continue. The road to healing isn't easy. You must be willing, ready, and able to let God mend the wounds. King James Psalms 29.10, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. This is one of the lessons I had to learn over the years. I couldn't write these memoirs now without knowing this. 
It's only through God's grace. And if you're following along, I'm turning to page 10 in mercy that I can clearly write. It's now with this understanding that I can genuinely encourage others while healing from my ordeals of the past. Okay, so that was chapter one. And once again, today, um, I am kicking off a two chapter read of Foster. You can kind of go ahead and say this would be my audiobook launch <laughs> in an unconventional way, right? Um, of Foster. And this is just basically in, in preparation and celebration of the new content that's coming out. I'll keep you posted. Um, but I wanted to present this to really encourage others to like write your write your stuff. If you have a memoir, if you have, a, you know, if you have a talent, a gift, an experience, if you found healing, a journey and purpose, write about it. Writing for me is healing, but yours may be music, dance. Okay, I could go on, right? <laughs> we'll get more into that. But let's dive into chapter two. And once again, if you're watching, feel free to please leave questions and comments. I will get to them um, at the end of the reading. I love to hear your thoughts. And if you, you have any questions or anything you want to share. All right, let's jump into chapter two. Introducing foster care. Page 11. So inside DSS, I sat on a bench waiting to meet a lady who sat vigilantly in one of the neatly arranged cubicles. Back then, at my age, I didn't understand that I was getting or I, that I was getting ready to be a ward of the state. Following governmental child care regulations, generally when a child becomes a ward of the state, the child is placed in a foster home, an orphanage, or shelter. Finally taken to the back area, I was introduced to a lady named Lenora Weekly. She was a heavyset, dark-skinned woman with thick glasses and a salt and pepper afro. She, The green turtleneck she wore hugged her frame snugly, and she eyed me over her thick silver glasses. Mrs. Weekly asked me many questions about my feelings and briefly about my parents. It wasn't explained why I couldn't see them, and I don't think I asked. I didn't know what was going on, and I didn't feel scared. I just answered with the flow. Um, I was also calm when she told me I would be going to live with the lady I was about to visit. Of course, at age four or so, I didn't, page 12, understand why this was happening. I'd come to believe that I was visiting or staying with several relatives. I believe now this made my transition into the system much easier. It was only when I reached a certain age that I get the feeling that I was an outsider. Leaving again with Mr. Frank took me to the first of many more road trips to come. Arriving at the home of Miss of the waiting Miss Ginger May, I was greeted by two of the white boys, John and Matt, that had come to meet me from across the street. The first day went by fast as I found Mrs. May's water bed and got stuck getting off of it. I would also meet and come to befriend the boys who lived across the street. Miss May was tall, slender, and brown skinned. She wore an afro and thick glasses. Miss May was one of the most helpful people I ever want to meet. She represented the absence of the mother I never knew. Talking with her, I learned she couldn't have children, but loved daily visits from John and Matt. They quickly became my buddies as we played outside. I had never met any kids from another race before John and Matt. These brothers would be my introduction. They, however, were very caring and would check on me and Miss May when coming outside. And John and Matt were maybe two or three years older than me. They would be considered lanky because they were still little. Both had pretty blue eyes and had beach blonde hair with 80s haircuts. <laughs> I had gotten into a new routine at Miss May's home. I loved her and wanted to stay with her forever. I was really young, so I never thought of my 
birth parents. I know that may sound bad, but once again, I feel this was because of my age. Soon I was introduced to preschool. This was a lot different from the other two daycare centers I often attended before. I must have just turned five because Miss Ginger May would ask what I wanted her to pack in my lunchbox. I never had a lunchbox at any of my daycares, so this was new. The preschool I started attending was pretty much a blur. I only remember eating my pack of lunch in the cafeteria. I never remember what happened in my classes or with the teachers I had. Despite this, I still interacted with the kids at the lunch table. I traded snacks and food with some of them and other children. And one day back home, when I wasn't with the guys, I wanted to explore the backyard. So Miss May had a screen door in the living room that led to the backyard. Once I noticed the pond behind her fence, I had to ask if I could go outside. I became fascinated with the pond as it, as I inched closer to it. I stopped inching when a coral snake came from the pond. It was as if it was coming after me. I started running to the house, screaming about the snake. Miss Ginger calmly came out and disposed of it with a shovel. I never asked to go back out to the pond again. <laughs> um, I'm laughing, thinking about this as if it was yesterday. Um, the running with the snake wasn't as scary as my next ordeal. So, like I said earlier, there's going to be times where I call on or recall graphic events that's happened to me. So, I'm going to give you a heads up of those things when they, they occur. And this stuff is not to scare anybody or be gross, but just to, you know, give you insight of the realness of the things I went through that I had not yet had any words for. Okay. All right. So here we go. It's about to get a little graphic. During uh, one of my baths, I recall sitting in the tub when a sharp pain started shooting through my rectum. As a little girl, all I know was I was in pain and Therefore, I was shaking and crying. Watching the bloody stool come out of me in the tub of water was as frightening as anything I ever encountered so far. Miss May rushed to call the hospital. This never happened at any of the daycares with my dad or back with Miss Holston. I rode in the back of an ambulance and it seemed like it took a long time, but I eventually arrived at the hospital. Now, call Palmetto Branch, and if you're in the, if you're in the Midlands, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it seemed like it was yesterday that Miss May checked me in to get examined. Not shortly after that hospital visit, I was removed from Miss May's home. I'm not sure why I was removed. Several reasons come to mind. Miss May was not wanting to deal with it, being equipped to deal with it. Or DSS wanted me in a therapeutic foster home. So a therapeutic foster home is a home equipped with a licensed foster parent able to care for foster children with special needs. These needs could be medical, behavioral, or sometimes both. In my case, it was medical. Thus, the therapeutic foster placement would be my second stop. I would never see Miss Ginger May again. I often asked future caseworkers about her, all of which were either too new or I didn't have any information. Also, I wouldn't get to the root of my medical condition until a later placement. For now, I was going to my second foster home. The primary lesson I had to take away was I had no control over the situation. So growing up, I had heard so many potential foster and adoptive parents expressing not wanting to let the children leave. Miss Ginger's home was that for me. I didn't want to leave her. I would never again have that feeling with any other home. I didn't even have this feeling leaving my father behind. I guess it's because of the connection I felt with Miss Ginger. Earlier, I mentioned knowing there were a lot of people out there that blame themselves for particular situations. Ordeals happen all the time within biological homes or with the relatives. 
realizing you didn't have control in a foster home or adoptive home is just as difficult. Although I knew I had no control, the spirit of rejection would still follow me well into adulthood. Yes, rejection can be a spirit because the root of it triggers how we handle people and circumstances in life. King James, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So despite the things we like to change in our lives, God already knows the plan for our lives to bring him glory. Our lives and testimonies can bring healing and deliverance because God brings us through the obstacles we face. Miss Dolores Langston was a brown-skinned woman with a close-cut afro. Unlike Miss May and Miss Holston, she was much shorter. I soon learned she worked as a nurse at the local mental hospital. And this is the update part for those of you who are here in the Midlands. Um, the brick wall that was there when I wrote this is no longer there. It's now um, torn down and they've built a baseball stadium in that area. Okay, that's the update. This was the first foster mom I had seen leaving home for work. I always saw Miss Dolores either in olive green or light blue hospital scrubs. Although this was taken, although I was taken to the hospital in my previous home, I was only given, okay, some graphic stuff coming up. I was only given a suppository to help me use the restroom. I had I had bowel problems that wouldn't be defined and properly treated until my next foster home. All right, so here we go. I'm getting into a graphic account. Just give you that heads up, okay? But also feel free to leave your comments and your questions in the in the area, and I will get to them. All right. So a suppository is a bullet-shaped gel-like medication inserted into either the vaginal or rectum. It dissolves administering medicine to the affected area. Because of my bowel problems, the suppository was introduced into my rectum. I had extreme constipation, making it painful to go to the bathroom. Consequently, Ms. Langston's medical expertise made life more comfortable for me. She could administer enemas at any time. Um, and however, to me, the enema was the worst alternative to the suppo suppositories. So an enema is a liquid medication found in a clear squeeze bottle with a long tip. And yes, the tip is inserted in the rectum where the medication targets the problem area. Of course, these were never fun times as it often took three to four people to hold me down. I squirmed and screamed for my mommy at the top of my lungs. Sadly, this was the only time I wanted my mother. Fortunately, because Ms. Dolores gave me these enemas and suppositories, my bowels, bowel movements were more natural. Unfortunately, however, the enemas were so uncomfortable. It may be surreal to you hearing I went through that um, as a child. You know, I often hear about suppositories and enemas for like the elderly community, but um, those conditions and stuff can, you know, affect um, me, you know, uh, people like myself, even younger, depending on the circumstance and situation. All right, let's continue. So we lived in an apartment complex, much like the one my father and I lived in before I was, in, I was fostered. So it may have been considered the hood to some. I say this because there were, that's where I was introduced to the ice cream truck, the neighborhood kids, and I witnessed domestic violence. Ms. Dolores Langston had a living daughter, Janice, who had two daughters, Olivia and April. Janice looked nothing like Ms. Holston, excuse me, Ms. Langston, thinking about Ms. Holston. I now assume Janice was either the daughter-in-law or her baby mama to uh, Mr. Lord's son. I'll mention him a little later. For now, I would get to know Janice and her daughters. Janice reminded me of Candace, Mrs. Holston's daughter. There it go, there it go, Ms. Holston. 
the Janice remind me of Candace Miss Tolson's daughter, but a little older, maybe in her early 30s. I didn't have much interaction with Janice other than standing at the hallway heater with her. Olivia and April had a darker complexion, much like Miss Holtz, Miss Dolores. I'm thinking about everybody right now. <laughs> much like Miss Dolores. Olivia was the oldest at maybe 16 or 17 and attended the local high school. Every day she wore a basketball jersey, baggy pants, and gold chain around her neck. The jersey and baggy pants looked funny on her slender frame. She wore her hair in a ponytail and struggled with acne. April looked a lot like Olivia and was one or two years older than me. She was somewhat stocky and mischievous, constantly getting into trouble with Miss Dolores for a lot of reasons. Along with April, I attended Christy Lance Elementary School, walking each weekday morning with Olivia and the other older kids. We crossed over a train tracks leading to Olivia's high school before visiting the woman who sold candy, the quote unquote candy lady, lived close by Christy Lakes Elementary. Most mornings, we approached her window where she sold a variety of candies, jarred pickles, boiled eggs, and pickled sausages. Now, I can imagine she purchased and sold the stuff either from her food stamp allowance or wrapped up from the local gas station. All right, so let's get into first grade. I remember attending the classes with other kids um, every day in the cafeteria, we ate from olive or beige bowls. I loved when we were served grits, minus the pepper. <laughs> At school, I complimented the teacher on the bubblegum machine t-shirt worn by her a lot. Seems like every day, right? At that time, um, the school had a swimming pool in the back. However, I always say no when the instructor asked, asked me if I wanted to get in the water. I did like putting on lotion that came in a blue cone-shaped bottle on my arms and legs at the pool. I may not have been academically prepared to start first grade. Before attending Christine Lance, I sat at the house or played with other neighborhood children. I never had any educational influences and believe that's why I had to attend two separate classes. In the main class, I had an assigned desk and got prizes for correct answers. Then every so often, I'd be pulled to attend a class across the hall with Miss Johnson. That class was more engaging and we made things, read stories and talked about events. Miss Johnson was much younger than my homeroom teacher, Miss Nesby. She, Miss Nesby was an older dark skinned woman who wore mixed match sweaters and skirts. She had thick red glasses had curly salt and pepper hair. And Miss Johnson, on the other hand, was young and white. She looked like she could be John and Matt's mom. Her hair was long, blonde, and she wore, page 18 for those following, matching sweaters and skirts. One day she decided to read Dr. Seuss's Green Eggs and Ham. Afterwards, we participated in an activity where she scrambled eggs on a burner and added green food coloring to the eggs. I recall asking why the ham isn't green. <laughs> she replied, because you get sick. I asked because I thought the word and in green eggs and ham meant that the ham and green was green just like the eggs. So she said with a polite no. Another activity Miss Johnson shared was making cotton candy. She talked about the upcoming fair and showed us how cotton candy was made. The best part was always that we got to eat the finished product. She asked if the class were going to the state fair. And of course, at that time, um, that was my first time hearing about the fair, but it wouldn't be my first time attending once I did. All right. Aside from going to the classes, we had nap time. I laid awake waiting for the nap time to end every time. One day before going outside to the pool or to the playground, Okay, don't ask me why, but I started flirting with this little boy in the class. Like I said, don't ask me where I got it from, but I showed <laughs> I showed him the strap of my undershirt. I don't ask me why. <laughs> Playing around with him, I don't know why I felt that I need to do that. 
maybe I thought it was cute. I don't know. That would be the first and my last time I did that. And it would be my first and last time going to the principal's office. So Christy Lance was a school that at that time, they don't do it no more. <laughs> Christy Lance was a school that at that time um, they gave paddles. And that would be my first and only time getting one. So the principal was a bald, short, dark-skinned man who wore suits like Mr. Franks, the social worker. He kept a black and purple fraternity paddle hanging above his desk. I learned that day what the other kids who were sent to him went through. I had to lie over his knee as he paddled a good five to six times. And of course, I cried and tried to shield my butt with my hands. That would be my last time getting in trouble at school. So at home, however... Uh, I followed April. I followed up April with a lot. I never got in trouble with the neighborhood kids, but we played under the stairwell, making it our quote unquote clubhouse. Anyone could attend. We waited on other kids to come, mainly girls, to come out and bring butter and cinnamon bread from their house. We nibbled on that. We all run around when we heard the music from the ice cream truck. The mailboxes for the apartments were set in the middle of the parking lot. The ice cream truck circled the parking lot in front of the mailboxes. Every one of us asked the adults or other kids for money to buy treats from the truck. Aside from playing with the familiar neighborhood children, there was an interesting little girl named Jessica. Jessica was a little light-skinned girl who was maybe one or two years younger than me. She often come outside in pigtails and a dress with flowers on them. Jessica often found me outside and would come to me pointing to the woods. When she pointed, she'd say, Saudi Arabia is coming. I didn't know who or what Saudi Arabia was. I often looked to the woods, actually believed one day someone or something would come out the bushes. I now know she just repeated what she heard from the news at home. When I played outside with the other kids, a next door neighbor would watch after us. Mrs. Sampson wore pink rollers in her hair, much like Miss Holston, but would sit out on her porch smoking a cigarette. She was brown skinned, very tall and skinny. Also, she would eat striped yellow and red sticky square candy. I always asked for some, but she never gave me any. Well, she finally did eventually one day. So since I'm sharing about sweets, I could tell you about my first Halloween while staying with Mr. Dolores Langston's in her home. All right. So, and once again, a first, the first, I don't know if other people have experienced this, but this is my first time. So, um, this is my first time experiencing this. I had a lot of firsts in this placement. Olivia dressed us up um, in April in big clothes and put lipstick drawings on our face. I never looked in the mirror, but I assumed we were dressed as clowns. Well, we trick or treat in the neighborhood at the familiar houses, receiving a lot of candy and other goodies. So back at the apartment, this is the part I'm talking about, Janice expected all of the candy for drugs and threw the majority of them away. More first included getting punched in the arm, spying on Olivia's friend, and getting in trouble with April. So one day, I saw the peanut butter sitting on the counter and decided I wanted some. Instead of asking for a sandwich, Olivia caught me sticking my finger in the peanut butter jar. She punched me in the arm and yelled, you don't stick your finger in the peanut butter jar. I cried, telling her, yes, ma'am. As I slumped on the couch, still aching from the punches, this, well, this was the last time I get in trouble with Olivia, but not the last time I'd be around her. Every so often, Olivia's friend Justine would stop by to visit Olivia outside. Justine always dressed like Olivia, wearing baggy jerseys, baggy pants, um, well, basketball jerseys and gold chains. Justine even wore her hair in the same stuck-up ponytail Olivia sported. But unlike Justine, 
or unlike Olivia, Justine was light skinned, stocky, and didn't have acne. When they sat outside talking, don't ask me why I did this, but I always come outside poking Olivia in the temple. I often did this or only did this when I heard her popping bubble gum from inside. I don't know. I, it just fascinated me. And I'm surprised she didn't punch me for that. For whatever reason, one day April and I accompanied Olivia to Justine's house. Uh, this next part is kind of blurry. Um, Olivia told us to stay on the couch and not to touch the Swiss roll on the coffee table. And of course, I ate the Swiss roll with April and went with April, who had beckoned me off the couch. And of course, the background noise starts, right? <laughs> Once again, I'm at home reading Foster. All right, April had already made her way to the door in the hall. She was hogging the door. I could barely see Justine folding back covers with someone. Now, I say it's blurry because I, I didn't know where Olivia went or what happened. Afterward, I think April finally let go of the door and we ran back to the apartment. Let me assure you that it wasn't until my writings that I really, I really realized April was a, a bad influence on me. I had never been taught how to defend myself or to know what was really right or wrong. You know, peeking in on Justine was April's idea along with okay, peeing in my clothes. This little girl was very manipulative. I mean, a term I would later be referred to as. Now, I can't recall why we were put in time out again, but April was always the mastermind. We had to sit Indian style on the floor against the bunk beds in the bedroom, like not asking for the peanut butter. I didn't ask anyone if I could go to the bathroom. Instead, I told April I had to go to the bathroom. She expressed she had already went in her clothes and that I could too. Of course, I followed her up again. I did and had to mop up the floor after. Now, I know you're probably thinking, why did you leave her? I mean, I didn't realize at the moment that if she had peed on the floor, the floor would have been wet. I also didn't know how April was able to get the mop without getting in trouble. Still, another time following, April caused me to end up with a mouth, with my mouth hanging open, trying to talk. April had told me it was time to brush my teeth when she never told me that before. But while brushing my teeth, I realized April had replaced the toothpaste with a different white cream. I stood there disgusted with my mouth hanging open. I then went to the room where Janice was sitting on the bed trying to explain what happened. I couldn't get the words. Page 22. Out. So she simply said, rinse your mouth out. April, on the other hand, was sitting on Janice's lap, staring at me, smiling. Time with April started getting more and more disturbing. She was able to convince me to do just about anything. And smoking a cigarette was no exception. One evening, April had talked me into smoking one of Miss Dolores' cigarettes. Like when I asked my dad for a sip of his beer. I didn't realize at the time that you can't hide the smoke smell. So as you can imagine, Mr. Lourdes came home upset. Not only did I receive my first whooping from her, but April and I had to eat and swallow the cigarettes. Yes, we ate them and they stayed embedded in my stomach until my next placement. Yes I, yes, I did say we had, you know, okay. Getting my first whooping was painful because it was my first and we always wore just panties around the house. Miss Dolores had told us to walk around the house in nothing but our panties. One day, a male visitor expressed I should have clothes on. Miss Dolores followed up with she, a quick, she's fine. Now, if you thought, okay, so I'm about to get into a graphic account. Just give you a heads up. So if you thought the toothbrush incident and cigarette ordeal were disturbing, they don't compare to what April did next. All right. Um, I must have woken from a nap because I found myself lying on a bed in one of the back rooms. 
This bed was big, so it had to be Miss Dolores's. The comforter was soft and had gold and red swirls. Realizing I was laying on the bed, April approached me. She expressed, you need to take off your panties. I was nervous and hesitant as I thought it was time for another enema. I suppose April had left because this was... I suppose April had left after I said this because of this, but then she returned. This time she said, Janice said, you need to take off your panties. She didn't say mommy, but once again, I fell for it. Once my panties were down, she proceeded to take off hers and then back on the bed only to mount me. Another first and writing now, I think that either April was influenced by what she saw back at that apartment or someone was touching on her. At this time, I had to be about five while April had to be about maybe six or seven. Whatever the case, this would trigger the inability to fend for myself well into adulthood. I'm disappointed to say I just laid there while she grinds in between my legs. I didn't know what to do or think. Gratefully, I didn't grow up to prefer girls to boys. But April was a girl, and this incident kick-started me into finally staying my distance from her. This foster home was a terrible placement. I could never recall what I ate except those cigarettes or peanut butter. Also, a lot of people were always in and out the apartment around the time for the weekend. This often occurred, especially when Ms. Dolores hosted crab leg night. People were everywhere and it became harder to walk to the bathroom. On one occasion, I had to go to the bathroom and accidentally stepped in the bowl on the floor. A man had newspaper spread on the floor and did a lot as did a lot of other people. Once I stepped in his crab leg juice, he responded, ah, and Mr. Lawrence said, go wipe your feet off. Miss Langston's apartment wasn't all that big. I mean, I can still remember the bland layout. As you enter the apartment, a brown couch faced the front door. The black square television placed to the right faced the brown plush couch. From the front door, you could see a silver air conditioning unit on the wall behind the couch. A wooden brown dining table separated the living room from the dining area. The hall leading to the bedrooms and bathrooms aligned to the right of the couch. Also, the right to the right was a white refrigerator freezer and led you to the kitchen with brown cabinets and the white refrigerator. Page 24. Harmonizing the rest of the area. I have always been good at remembering places and faces, not so much with names. Meeting my new garden at Lightham would be a face and name I would never forget. Before I get into, before I could get the chance to meet her, I'd have to witness some domestic violence. So, 24. One night, a man came to the Langston apartment. I had seen him before. Steve was a brown skinned medium built man with a mustache and an afro. I always saw him in black leather jackets. I don't know if Steve was Mrs. Dolores' son or Janice's child's father. I think the latter because she didn't care because he didn't care about grabbing Janice in front of us. He found Janice in the back room where she ran to get away from him. He came into the kitchen where Janice had retreated with Miss Dolores. As he entered the kitchen, he began hitting Janice and dragging her across the floor. Miss Dolores yelled from him to stop, but he continued his triad. Soon we heard a knock at the door. A neighbor had called the cops, and they were there in what seemed to be five minutes. I didn't know what to do, so I just sat there in the corner. The officer at the door questioned Steve, handcuffed him, and took him away. Writing this now, I can imagine he may have had a restraining order against him after that incident. I had more Garden at Lightroom visits to Miss Dolores' house. And I said, and as I said earlier, each 
foster child is appointed a court appointed advocate called a guardian ad litem. Uh, they act as the court's liaison for the judges, family courts, and social services agencies. So on my meeting with my court appointed guardian, guardian ad litem, Mrs. Daisy, I decided to share some of my adventures. I mean, I mentioned what I watched on television, what I did at school, and stepping into the crab leg juice. Um, I don't know or I can't really recall if I ever told her about April on top of me eating the cigarettes or going to the other apartment. I now know mentioning what I watched on television influenced m most of my removal from this home. Later as an adult, I was involved in a speaking engagement with Miss Daisy. At the engagement, she recalled the scary shows I told her I had watched. So I grew up loving to watch scary movies until God delivered me. But despite the chaos I mentioned earlier, I can recollect a few good memories. Miss Dolores had this glass grape replica I found fun to play with. I enjoyed doing the activities at the school and playing with neighborhood kids. And finally, eating good ice cream was always a last thing. Unfortunately, what I've learned from this home experience is that I couldn't change my surroundings or the people, and it lacked a positive life and academic skills that I needed. So Psalms 32, King James Version, um, 8, Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in a way thou should go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Even to this day, I'm learning the life lesson that I can't change my surroundings or others. Instead, I can remove myself from certain situations and environments. However, a recent heart's pill to swallow was that I still must show the love of Christ. A lot of times when we're hurt, misunderstood, or don't agree with what's being displayed by family and friends, we shut down, run away, and often isolate ourselves. It's not always easy remembering to love someone who's hurt you, to love those who you're not comfortable being around, and still love in situations you desire not to tolerate. A lesson I still face even in my writings is that I must take one day at a time. When I try to figure out a person or situation that differs from me or my views, it becomes overwhelming. The reality is that God is the only one who truly cleanses our hearts and minds from the distractions of this life and even ourselves. This is a lesson I had to face entering my next placement. I came to imagine myself living with medical condition would be fully addressed and I was reminded why I was a foster child. Not only did I learn who I wasn't, I endured a six-year process of learning about life and people, also how I didn't fit in into either of the categories. If you count Miss Holston as a foster placement or parent, she count as the first of nine. I learned about Mrs. Holston was my first, or should I say, wow, maybe Miss Holston was my first. Miss Bertha Agnes became my third foster home. Okay, so I'm about to do a transition here. I'm about to go into uh, my next placement. And technically, I, I think uh, Miss Langston would have been considered my second while Miss Holston is like a, a, a child care, I would say Miss Holston is more like a child care, a daycare, like babysitter. So, but you could consider it as a foster home as well, maybe. All right, let's get into it. While Miss Holston was the first, Miss Bertha Ang Angus became my third foster home. I had to be around age six, going on seven years old, the day I was picked up from the agency. Miss Angus asked a lot of questions so I felt comfortable like I was around Miss Daisy. Inside the home, Miss Angus didn't say much but tossed me a prefix peanut butter and apple butter sandwich and said to me, hurry up. Getting in the car, we rode to pick up her granddaughter from high school. 
a little ways up the road. Meeting Patrice was pleasant enough. She said hello to me as I peeked around on the seat to greet her. A few things I'd come to learn in my new placement was only by observations and the few questions Miss Angus did answer. Answers to my questions consisted of Patrice lived at the house because her mother died, Mr. Terry was her son, and Mr. Angus was in military service. That's why we went to went on post for church and grocery shopping. I met another girl when I first came to live with Miss Angus. Sarah had what you call a mental disorder. However, at age six, Miss Angus expressed it as being retarded. Sarah would do weird things, um, but would calm down when I took time to read to her. She had to be around 12 or so, but I felt like her big sister. Sarah had a jerry curl and reminded me of Olivia. Unlike Olivia, Sarah wore dresses and barely spoke. On one occasion, Miss Angus told us not to kiss Mr. Angus on the head for a gift he'd gotten out of the kindness of his heart. I mean, I don't know why she called that out, but Sarah did, and her gift was taken away for it. Shortly after Sarah was removed from the home, I met a new girl named Lily. The first day I met Lily, she wore a helmet, gritted her teeth, and bumped her head. This became my second introduction to a therapeutic foster home. I endured adult kid and teen choir rehearsals until Patrice brought a portable television for all the children to watch. Patrice was not only kind, but extremely thoughtful compared to the standoff demeanor of Miss Angus. Watching television shows like Family Matters and Step by Step allowed the time to pass a lot faster. I believe Angus grew tired of people in church asking her about me joining in activities. After a few months, I became one of the Sunday acolytes so acolyte um, is performing ceremonial duties such as lighting altar candles. I had a part in the Easter program and finally got to sing on the children's choir. The church on the military base changed pastors constantly. They were called chaplains. Attending church was a first for me, but wouldn't become the last as I grew up. I'll enlighten you more into this in my third installment. At the time, Miss Angus passed and as time passed um sorry at, at that time so as time passed at Miss Angus's I grew older yeah there we go and quickly learned my place as a foster child everyone else in the household had rooms upstairs while my bedroom was downstairs I don't recall having birthday parties or going anywhere for fun during my six year stay. Instead, I took notice of my surroundings and how I was treated at home in public and while attending school. At home, Mrs. Angus would tell me to go outside and play. Locking the door behind me, I stayed outside for hours by myself in the backyard close to nighttime. As a little girl, I entertained myself with a tree swing, trampoline, tether ball, and mud pies. Inside the house, I had a television schedule I'd watch according to the day and time. The channels I could watch consisted of Barney, Nickelodeon, Nick Jr., Disney, and PBS. This was another first as educational programming would shape and help resolve much of my, de de <laughs> my developmental um, delays uh, that were not addressed in previous placements. And during the weekend, we have a movie night at least once or twice so video cassettes tapes at the time were very popular i often watched the disney movies wishing to escape to a different reality i will say that a lot of the food miss angus cooked i learned to cook for myself as an adult i always asked if i could help in the kitchen but i was told no i only knew that mr terry the son was a police officer and his daughter Hannah would visit during the weekends when we had movie night. I met her mother maybe twice. I recall and recall loving the egg sandwich Hannah didn't finish. 
I don't know if Mr. Terry and Hannah's mom were married or separated, but I only saw him early in the morning before going to bed. Or, excuse me, before going to school. This was the first home I recall living in with males in the household other than the time with my dad. During one particular movie night, a television miniseries called Queen, starring Holly Berry, uh, was on television. So like the green eggs and ham, I associated Hannah's light skin complexion with the word negress used on the main character, not understanding at the time that it was a derogatory word I'd express. See, Hannah, she's a negress like you. Miss Angus stated a bit harshly, don't listen to her, Hannah. That's why she's nothing but a foster child. I was hurt by the comment and, and didn't understand that what I said was wrong and it wasn't explained to me either. The older I got, it became apparent that Lily and I were treated differently from the Angus's grandchildren. I recall a, a ride in the car when Miss Angus said to Patrice, that little $700 per month DSS gave wasn't enough. It was during the car rides, Miss Bertha Angus would regularly talk about people and situations to Patrice. At the time, Patrice was in the 10th or 11th grade, so gossip often included people at the church expressing what they wore or Patrice's friends who weren't up to standards. The funny thing is, although she talked in code, I understood who or what she talked about. Although I never said anything, I had to learn how to maneuver and comprehend things on my own. I especially understood that Lily and I were made to feel slow or different because of our living situation. I came to the knowledge that while she was complaining about DSS, the money that they gave, we stayed in a three-story home. I also noticed how Patrice and Miss Angus' his hair kept were kept up along with their nails done at the shopping mall practically every week while all of my and Lily clothes came from the Salvation Army or thrift store. So going to school, I always look messy like the pictures I saw of my mother. My hair stayed looking messy while I wore clothes that weren't age appropriate for me. The day Lily was picked up from the DSS gave me insight on how I arrived. Once again, I was an earshot of Mrs. Angus's gossip. Now, before you express, because I heard this a lot growing up, <laughs> now before you express that I needed to stay in a child's place, I want to say I couldn't control my surroundings. Much of this gossip was always in the car with me in the back seat, and I wasn't trying to listen. It's just, it's just that it became apparent when Miss Angus assumed that I didn't understand or comprehend anything. That's when it kind of stuck out to me. To my understanding, Lily and I were always singled out. Lily came from an abusive home. Miss Angus told Patrice how Lily was kept in the basement with other kids who ate their feces. The white lady who kept them lived in a mansion. I saw how Lily gritted her teeth and rocked all the time. The helmet she wore prevented her from hurting her head when she butted it against the wall. Lily was placed on a leash and after several outings, she broke away running. Lily was a fast runner and I was always sent to go catch her and often hold the leash. Now, I will say that despite how Miss, Mrs. Bertha was, she did have some good attributes. The bit of time Lily and I lived together, Mrs. Bertha taught her how to pronounce her words and find, and really finally comb out her matted hair that stayed matted under her helmet. Um, as a young adult, I ran into Lily and a new foster child at the state fair. I'm happy to share that the older Lily didn't need a leash or wear that helmet anymore. Speaking of matted hair, the main reasons I was teased at school, my hair stayed messy and undone. I wore non-age appropriate thrift store clothes and silver caps didn't hide my dental problems. And I had to attend special education classes Having messy hair and old clothes 
made it easy for my peers to make fun of me. My heart, it was hard to miss the silver caps and special classes, which really helped me become a bigger target for cruel jokes. My hair and clothes I could deal with. It was just the dental jokes that always tore me down. It would seem that my smile came from poor hygiene. However, I later learned that both my dental and medical issues were passed down to me through hereditary problems. The picture of my mother with silver caps confirmed this. So like my mother, I had to wear silver caps over many of my impacted and decaying baby teeth. In this placement, I finally obtained a dentist. I was told that Medicaid could only cover silver caps. Later in the same home, a male caseworker took me halfway across the state for dental work. Mr. Avery Carson was a tall, slender, light-skinned man with a big mustache and rounded afro and thick glasses. Our drive took us an hour away as I eventually found myself in another dental office. After meeting with the new dentist, Mr. Carson asked if I wanted my teeth to look like the teeth model he held up. Shaking my head, yes, I didn't know what that actually meant. I imagined my teeth would be straight and white at both the top and bottom. More importantly, I thought that I wouldn't be picked on by the kids anymore. What I didn't know was that I would have a procedure done on the same day. I would also not know that I endure, um, well, I also didn't know they keep me awake, let me say that, as he set me up for the work to get performed. I felt the multiple needles as my impacted baby teeth were taken out of my gums. Afterwards, my mouth was sore, bloody, and swollen. I had no idea, well, I, no, I had no idea I had to do with stitches and dry mouth for weeks. And during several weeks of swelling, I eventually came to own a full, uh, not full, but a few white caps and a temporary partial. My mouth was half done and I was an adult. I need corrective work. I can't afford a fence. So let me let me say this right here. Um, a lot of people may not know this, but a lot of times when children go through the foster care system, they endure and I don't know how it's changed since I was in the system, but I know of a, a lot of people probably enduring a lot of medical stuff done to them. And now as adults, they they wasn't able to correct it or it was half completed. So I really wish and hopefully something will be put in place for the ones that may have to go through foster care in the future. Something better in place to kind of help them have corrective surgeries, whether it's dental or medical, that's fully complete because that's also traumatizing leaving the foster care system and, that, and then really have to really be stuck with a lot of that stuff that you can't afford to fix on your own. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. So as an adult, I often look back on this beating myself up. I know I couldn't understand fully, but I wish I had a better understanding of what I would agree to. I assumed at the time that all the dental work would be done all at once and that it would solve all my dental issues. Now, I believe that Mr. Carson was either fired or replaced because that was the last time I'd see him. I think what he was asking me was going over the plans of the dentist I had back at home. Either that or it wasn't effectively communicated to the agency himself and the dentist. Whatever the case, I've endured the results up to now in these writings despite now despite how this really came about, I wish, and this is what I just said, I wish DSS could have approved all white caps. I feel this would have alleviated years of kids taunting. This scar, along with my stomach scar, stayed with me into adulthood. I couldn't control the teasing from this, of course. Thus, I began, or really began to have low um, self-esteem and major low self-esteem and didn't know how to fend for myself. Leave me a comment, you know, let me know if you have any childhood experiences where this it was something medical or something beyond your control and you were teased for it. I, I would love to know what that was and how did you deal with that? How did you face that? Feel free to leave that in the comment. And after 
me reading the second chapter. We'll talk about it. All right, to continue. So waiting at the bus stop was a nightmare, along with riding on the bus and going to class. At the bus stop, children threw rocks at me like a straight animal. Yes, I said children threw rocks at me. Eventually, it stopped, but it wasn't until a mom waiting with her child in the car said something to stop it. I don't know how long she noticed this um, until she inter intervened. It seemed to me that her car was there every day they threw the rocks. So on the bus, two older girls would make fun of me daily while a guy put nail polish on the beige coat I wore. The same kid threw notebook paper with rocks balled up in them at me, or at least I assumed they were rocks. It was hard when it hit me. Out of frustration, I eventually started throwing paper back at him, but it didn't deter his cruelty. When the paper hit me, it was very painful. I never knew how he did it. The girls on the other, the girls and others always got a good laugh at my expense. So chasing, excuse me, so changing seats and sitting behind the bus driver didn't help because the school, or excuse me, because the driver never said anything as the hits and taunts continued. Okay, if anybody's watching, know any bus drivers, or used to be a bus driver, or is currently a bus driver, if you see bullying, please address it. That's, I'm going I'm to just say this, that's one of the most traumatizing things when you're being bullied and an adult is ignoring it. And I know he or she may be focusing on the road, but they also have to watch and hear what's happening in their surroundings. So I'm going to express if you are a, a, a bus driver or if you're a, even if you're a teacher or a mentor or advocate, please, please, please intervene if you see or hear bullying. That's the worst thing to just have an adult ignore it. Okay. I just wanted to express that. To continue. All right. So it became so unpleasant for me. I eventually had to switch buses. Now I can imagine you could ask, well, what did you do to cause this? Honestly, nothing. I can honestly say it, I did nothing. Earlier, I mentioned how I wasn't taught how to defend myself. This included fighting and having a backbone. So sadly, the switch to the new bus and taking classes at the alternative school would be the only piece I'd come to know. A special short bus started to come and pick me up from school. However, this bus started taking me to um, another school with special classes in the mornings at lunchtime. A regular bus would pick me up along with my classmates and drop us to the conventional schools. At the morning school, I was in a smaller class with five or so other kids. This class reminded me a lot of class I had attended when I lived with Miss Dolores. We had story time, snack time, activities, and academics. I didn't yet understand that I was in a special education class. I joined my other classmates at primary school at lunchtime. So briefly as an adult, I had a chance to substitute teach in K-5 schools. Much like what I experienced with teasing and special classes is still occurring today. Today, many of the classes have doubled in size. Many students were weeded out, especially at the beginning stages. Standardized testing it's purposely, and this is just my opinion. I know everybody has different views, but I'm, I'm a, anybody who knows me knows I'm a strong advocate against a lot of this stuff. But so standardized testing is purposely placed within schools to weed out the weak from the strong. I've witnessed students who performed well practicing for the standardized testing in class. However, when they came out of maps or other testing, they were actually stressed I know what these students are going through. It's not that they don't know the material, it's that the material changed from what is practiced in the classrooms. So what I mean is in class, they practice one plus two equals three. On the standardized testing, they are asked, well, if I have three apples, cut one in half, bite one and give one away to another, how many are left? It's already kind of set up to weed out and pre-categorize, if that makes sense. Now, you could say these, these are skills that the child should already be learning. And yes, 
This is true, but many of the kids come from single parent broken homes with no role models or mentors who take the time to recap or enhance what they were taught in school. The other thing that has changed is how schools now have in-school psychiatrists. Now, during my school years, a psychiatrist would come to the school and ask each child what they saw on the picture. Today, a student can be sent to the in-school psychiatrist's office and come back on medication. This had happened without a parent present, but also regularly with a parent present. So sadly, many parents from an underprivileged background are talked into accepting this practice. Putting a kid on medication is a tactic to keep them contained and categorized. You know, that's the sad truth. And unfortunately, many parents take the bribe money to sign up their kid. I've had to encourage many students who were labeled problem students. These kids were the ones on meds and shoved together in the same place, special needs classes. Also, most of the students were African-American and Hispanics. These kids, from my perspective, were really gifted students. They either had a language barrier or were medicated up. Therefore, problem student was how they saw themselves. I had to tell someone, you can do it or you can make it. Many times after their primary teacher ignored them, talked over them, their head or fussed them out in front of me. You know, I know encouragement works because many of these students perked up and tried harder after I talked with them and not at them. Moreover, I realized later that I had a positive impact on them. Many of the students would come up hugging me, telling me they loved me or wish I was their teacher. You know, not to take any credit or anything away from their teacher. It's just that I realized or I related from their past and from my past. So I'm slowly working on a developmental service that serves um, as a one-stop. The service will cater to these types of students along with foster children to assist them um, before they're pre-labeled or during the process of pre-labeling um, from, remedi from remedial opportunities, meaning uh, they should provide a connective service um, that engages their academic, personal, creative, and personal needs. The service will go to them and meet them right where they are according to their needs. And that is in the works. All right, so getting back to my transitions. So I, I always left um, the morning school around lunchtime. I liked riding the regular bus because getting off the special bus was another embarrassment. It was as if I was being punished for not getting along with the other kids. Back at my primary school, I'd eat lunch and attend a list of diverse engaging classes. I'd come to excel in language arts, reading, spelling, and music. And at this time, I was in second grade. So that's where the testing and stuff comes in now for a lot of, a lot of kids. Um, speaking of music, I was surprised when Miss Angus allowed me to participate in school music trips and church programs. Music allowed me to sing in different musicals and attend different holiday trips with other kids. Participating in music at school also opened the opportunity to join the children's choir back home. Although I did well with these subjects, I feel that I was singled out due to struggles I faced in math. Mrs. Angus made me feel slow because math was my weakest subject. Math was the only subject that had me stuck and frustrated. I think because Patrice was gifted, my other efforts became overlooked. I had to go to Patrice for math help because I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any academic counsel before coming to Angus' home. Now, as a second grader, my math issue would now shed light where I needed help. I continued feeling that I didn't fit in with my peers and at home. Earlier, I talked about seeing the school psychiatrist. I was pulled many times from class to talk to a person who asked me what I saw on the card they hold up. I believe my answers now encourage the attendance of remedial classes. 
I grew to understand that an unstable living environment provides one of the many factors of why children have troubles in academics. The older I became, I accepted the issue having to take math classes. I recall coming home plenty of times and excitement for a good grade or improvement, expecting encouragement from Mrs. Angus, I'd always leave disappointed. Mrs. Angus would tell Patrice that they'd give me the grade just to pass me. I soon grew accustomed to non-encouragement and the fact, the hard fact of the reality for me was that Lily and I were only there to contribute to the house funds. All right, that concludes chapters, in, well, the introduction and chapters one and two of this week's reading of Foster. And so, um, and I hope you tune in next week. I will be doing this again next week for chapters three and four. And so, yeah, I wanted to do like a, this is like an impromptu, I guess you could call it, audio <laughs> reading of this book because I have some new writing material that I'll be launching. I can't tell you when, um, but it's coming this year. And so I'm super excited for that. If you are looking on the screen, you'll see the chapters here kind of in your face. So basically, we just got through the introduction, chapter one and two. And for next week, we're going to go into I Could Have Died and meeting number one. Okay. So next week, next Saturday in 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, I will be covering chapters three and four. I Could Have Died in meeting number one. So I really appreciate you taking time with me here today. Once again, I'm author Shalina Michelle Tate. I have some new writing and materials in the works. And so I wanted to kind of share this with you um, to really encourage you to like write your stories, write your memoirs, work on those projects. In other words, get out of procrastination. You know, a lot of times we could get procrastinated with life and stuff and then projects and gifts we have can be put on the back burner. But I think this year is a year that we could kind of shake off the dust, finish those projects, write that book, um, go on that trip, go back to school, whatever your thing is that you're being led to do, take a leap of faith and do it. I think that's what I want to say in all of this. Don't be afraid and, and don't worry about, you know, how it sounds or how it looks. A lot of times we, we let fear kind of hold us back because of what will others think or what will others say or how, what, you know, if it's, you know, if it's for me, if it's a stirring or God led or, you know, something that's going to help somebody else, that's where I get the, the most excitement. And so find whatever that thing is for yourself. And also, if you want to follow along with anything I'm just reading, uh, feel free to um, grab my link. I'll share it with you here. All right. So on the main event page, you know, um, if you want to read with me, you grab your Kindle at that um, web address right there. HTTPS Amazon is shortened dot two and three. Uh, 2 w r w 2 w and that's you can type that link in I'll send you right to the page and you can get a copy of the ebook follow along with me and let me go to some of these comments I think somebody said some comments here I appreciate y'all for even listening today super excited for just the journey of foster and once again this is part one of a three-part series and so um the other stuff is in the works let's see hey miss Rosalyn I just I saw what you said, hey sis. So hey, Miss Rosalind. Well, if you have any questions about foster care, you may not have any today. But if there's something I read today that you want to know more about, or if you just have some questions in general about any of the anything I read, you know, feel free to ask, and I will expound on that. If you don't have any questions yet, you know, if you you know, feel free to save them for next week. Once again, next week. Um, I'm covering chapters three and four of Foster, and you can once again follow along from that link. Grab your copy, your ebook, and follow along. And it's really very humbling to get to this point of like this is a new journey. All right, some more projects are coming in, along, and you know the goal really is to highlight the achievement. 
once again, the writings is to highlight the achievement focus. And as you know, and as I always kind of go into, you know, anybody that's associated with those communities, foster care, adoption, orphan, being from the underserved community, we, a lot of times we get a negative rap or we always hear about ourselves in a negative content or news media or statistics and Anybody who knows me, I'm like an advocate against statistics because statistics keep you in a box of telling you you can only go but so far or you can only do but so much. But as I'm growing into the understanding of, you don't have to listen to statistics. You don't have to listen to, you know, the discouragement of life. And yes, you may have gone through life and hardships and things that have been a setback. And as I read in the first two chapters of Foster, you saw where... You know, I, the stuff I went through, just crazy stuff. But the lessons, that's the key. The lessons that I've learned from those ordeals, that's where the healing can begin. And like I said earlier, you know, hey, you may not be a writer. You may be a musician. You may want to go back to school. You may have a, a business idea. I have about three of them. <laughs> Whatever your thing is, that's what I'm trying to say. Find that thing, those things to encourage you to bring encouragement, not just for you, but others. What What are those things you have a stirring for that can be game changers, that can break the mold? And once again, these are not just the like, you're not, I know, okay, I know the life we live in is very competitive, but it's not about competition. Let me say that. Our lives individually is not about anybody's competition, even though we see that all day, every day on news, media, and life. It's not a competition. Why? It's because Every one of us, myself included, and you definitely, we all have different purposes individually. Every individual, and it doesn't matter your age, your race, where you live, how much money you have or don't have. It doesn't matter if you have a college degree or not. It doesn't matter if, you know, it doesn't matter. Whatever your situation is unique to you, you may be a single parent, you may, you know, live in the slums, you may, um, feel like you come from nothing or you may have had everything and you may feel as if you want to make a I don't know a dynamic contribution to something whatever your thing is whatever your off is what I'm trying to say is find that off find that stirring find your purpose and so once again I'm reading these things from Foster because I'm now coming to a place of realizing my purpose now, although I'm reading these items from Foster and it sounds like very sad and like, oh man, you went through that. Know that it's not for anybody to be sad or downtrodden. It's really just carrying you on a learning experience and a journey to say, hey, look, yeah, I may have gone through those things, but the achievement, I found achievement. I've, I'm finding purpose. I'm finding um, progression and you can too. So maybe you need a journal. Grab a journal and start writing some stuff down. You have a business idea, write that stuff down. Get it, get it, register with your state. Get a team that you know can help you with that. I'm on that journey now. You want to write your book? You can do it. Don't ever let anybody tell you, you know, it's impossible. And I will say this, since I'm sharing this testimony from author point of view, if you are wanting to write your book, I'm, I'm express this to you because I know quite a few people who are wanting to write their books. The best advice I could give you for writing is you have to focus on specifically like, okay, what do you want to write about and who do you want to write for and why do you want to write it? Because I can only tell you from my experience, if you're writing from a place of I'm going to get back at this person or anger or resentment or bitterness, it could delay the process of your healing. For me, I found healing in writing. And a lot of times we think, okay, by this time next year, I'm going to have this done. I'm going to have that done. But as I'm finding for myself, and I can't speak for anybody else, but as I'm finding for myself, things are about timing. And you know what? You know, maybe three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago, I wasn't ready to published foster maybe it had to be in 2018 and then for me maybe in 2018 when I was ready to put out parts two and three it wasn't ready yet everything has timing 
And now we're here in 2023. And who knows what will happen, you know? I, I do have goals and plans, but what I'm saying is take one day at a time. That's all I, I could really say is strive to take one day at a time and find the achievement because there's achievement somewhere. I mean, you may not feel like it, but try to find and pull the achievement out of whatever situation you may face or have faced or, you know, go through and see how you can help others find that achievement and that purpose and that light for themselves as well. And maybe, maybe your testimony is the thing to do just that. And once again, if you are an aspiring author, remember to like write your stuff out, write your stuff down. Why do you want to write your book? What is your testimony? And the biggest thing is write, write, write until you're not angry no more. Write, write, write until you're not bitter no more. Write, write, write until you don't want to get back at so-and-so and so-and-so. What am I saying? If you can't do it from a place of anger and bitterness and, and resentment, and you have to find healing. You have to be processed. You have to be ready. And when you can write from a place of, you know what, this happened to me, that happened to me, but you know what, I, I, I forgive that person. More importantly, I forgive myself. Trust me. That for me, that was took several years, but I'm getting there now. So I'm hoping if this encourages you in some way that you get there too. And every day is a journey, so don't get discouraged. You know, I know this life teaches us that we have to have things now, have it handed to us now, we have to live for now, we have to keep up with the Jones, we have to, but we don't have to do all that. Just taking one day at a time is all we need to do. And it's okay. Take one day at a time and start creating your story. And create your story with love and laughter, with memories, with healing, with deliverance, with life. And that's what will carry you through. All right. So once again, just to recap, today I shared with you my book, Fostered. This is part one to a three-part memoir series where um, I'm expounding on my 17-year journey through the foster care system in South Carolina. Uh, I will expound on personal events and just ordeals I went through, but I will also give you heads up about that stuff. And I will also tell you about the lessons that I've learned. And, you know, so you can know that there's light always at the end of every situation. And so once again, next week, I will be sharing with you, um, and once again, I will be doing this for the month of January. My book is eight chapters, so I will be covering two chapters a week. So for next week, you can tune in at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to be doing this again next week, and tune in just like you just did. And I will read chapters three and four, I Could Have Died, and meeting number one, and then followed by week three hands-on kind of person, standing alone. And in the final week, what was I thinking in the unexpected milestone? All right. Well, as you know, and anybody who knows me, I could talk. <laughs> I'm not trying to talk you to death, but I really appreciate those of you who tuned in today. And I'm going to leave the floor open briefly now. If anybody has any questions or any statements, from what I've read, or if you have an experience you'd like to share that you've been through and but that you've learned from or have grown from, let me know. And if you don't have anything, no worries. Um, I will see you next week and we can tune in same time, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you missed everything I just said and you just tuning in like now, um, this is going to be on replay. So you go back and watch and um, once again, I covered the introduction in chapters one and two of Foster. So that's why this live is super long. But I hope that in listening to the reading, you got encouragement. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you again next week, same time. All right. Well, that does it for me. I appreciate each and every one of you. I'll see each and every one of you next week. And remember, as always, like I say on the podcast, being fostered, adopted, orphaned and underserved simply means you're gracefully chosen. See you next week.
same time.